Thanks, Skip. Uh, we, we really appreciate uh, the Clinton School for Public Service and the Clinton Library for hosting tonight and the Little Rock Film Festival, who's, who's uh, also partnered with us in, in, in these events. Uh, this is the third time that the Arkansas Times and the Clinton School for Public Service have collaborated to host an event uh, based on the reporting, based on reporting done by the Arkansas Times. It's, um, we strongly believe in, in, in inter interacting with our readers and we appreciate the Clinton School for supporting that vision. Tonight's program is about capturing, uh, capturing courtroom trials on video. Most trials in Arkansas and elsewhere are not recorded. Tonight, our panelists will make the case for why all trials should be recorded. Uh, Mar Leverett, who wrote the cover story, The Case for Cameras in Court, uh, for the Arkansas Times, uh, for, for which tonight's event is based, is a contributing edit editor to the Arkansas Times and the author of the books, The Boys on the Tracks and Devil's Knot the latter of which will be uh, adapted or has been adapted and will be released next year as a feature film adaptation starring Reese Witherspoon and Colin Firth. After spending 18 years in a prison for a crime he did not commit, Jason Baldwin was released last year after submitting an offered plea where he entered a guilty plea while maintaining his innocence. Since his release, Jason and his girlfriend Holly Ballard, who's with us tonight, uh, have been traveling <laughs> I've been traveling the country advocating on behalf of of those in prison for crimes they didn't commit today Jason and longtime supporter John Harden announced the formation of a nonprofit Proclaim Justice which is dedicated to that mission Jason and Holly live in Seattle where Jason attends community college he's considering law school so thanks, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna move over here and, and uh, we're gonna have a brief question and answer session and then we'll have plenty of time for, for you all to ask questions. So la last night, for those of you who, who weren't there, we showed Paradise Lost at the Argentina Community Theater. For those who haven't seen the film, Perhaps the most striking thing about it is the access that the filmmakers, Joe Berlinger and Bruce Sanofsky, were able to get. Uh, basically, all parties involved in the film contribute. Uh, the victims' families, your families, uh, Damien and Jesse's families. Even more striking is that the filmmakers were able to film in the courtroom. And so we see these two amazing trials unfold. What effect do you think the, the, the film, and particularly the, the courtroom footage, had on your case? I think it had a great effect. Um, had it not been for Joe and Bruce down there filming Paradise Sauce, filming the trials and everything, no one would have known of the terrible injustice that occurred. Um, we would have just been forgotten, swept up under the rug. Damien would have been executed, and Jesse and I would have just been, you know, left there to grow old and, you know, pass away and find ourselves in a, in a, um, in the, in the prison cemetery, you know. So it, it just energized and focused everybody, you know, everybody who saw it and recognized it for what it was, the injustice, and everybody's hearts, you know, were moved to help and and bring about the saving of Damien and Jesse and. I being free to you know be with our families and loved ones today. Mara, as you've pointed out before, um, this this was an exception to the rule. This filming in a courtroom in Arkansas, uh, you know, Arkansas and elsewhere, as we've said, that doesn't rarely allows for uh, this kind of access. How come? Historically. Courts have been very reluctant in the old days. Uh, going back to the Lindbergh trial, there were attempts to get uh, cameras in courts and, and a lot of problems associated with them. The O.J. Simpson trial, a lot of people thought that Judge Ito didn't uh, maybe behave as well as he should have. And there have been setbacks 
to the point that a lot of very good judges in particular have felt that the cameras were a detriment to the achievement of justice in, in trials. So that as a result, in the federal system, there are no cameras, no federal trial. The, the um, uh, Timothy McVeigh trial, for instance, would have been very interesting to have seen, but never, nothing is recorded at the federal level. States, it's a patchwork. By, by state by state, court by court within that. And that's true in Arkansas. <clears throat> and so it was remarkable, extraordinary, almost miraculous that this particular trial got filmed, these two trials. What had to happen? First of all, it had to be such a sensational case, three eight-year-old children murdered. Second, the alleged motive satanic killing by teenagers was sensational enough to attract uh, a cable television network's attention. And then two really fine, dedicated documentary filmmakers flown in from New York, who then embedded themselves in the West Memphis area for almost six months between the time of the murders and the trials, working, working, working to try to get access. And what access did they need to get? As you said, Lindsay, they had to get not just approval from the judge, they had to get approval from the prosecuting attorneys, from the defense attorneys, from the families of the victims, from the families of the defendants. An impossible hurdle to overcome. People were paid, people were paid money uh, for not, if not explicitly, implicitly for the privilege of getting these cameras into the courtroom. And so it was accomplished by the dedication of these, these filmmakers. Can anyone think of any other trial in Arkansas where that's happened? It doesn't. And yet we are at a point where we have more people in prison than we have ever had before, and we have less media coverage of trials than we have ever had before. Newspapers are cutting back on court tr coverage. All media are cut, cutting back. My contention is that we should not have to rely on media interest in a sensational trial for that one in a zillion trial that might end up being covered. All trials should be covered. We've got easy technology now. We could easily online it. In fact, the Arkansas Supreme Court recently, in this case, this very case, began to, for the first time, online streaming of oral arguments before that court. We could do this for every court, every court, every trial, and have a record. And I'll just say, right here are the disks containing the videos of the entire two trials of the West Memphis Three. It's this simple. It could be available from a court reporter, it could be available online. We should be doing this, and we should not be expecting it to have to go through a medium of television, newspaper, somebody fighting that battle. The courts, I believe, should, and I'd like to have that conversation started, not just in Arkansas, but nationally. To be clear, you, you mentioned that payments were made, not to the prosecutors or, or the judges involved in the case. I should Can, be, can you talk about absolutely. how they got on board, what sort of hurdle or what the process was, how, how it worked. Well, I will say that the defense attorneys were paid uh, to, uh, uh, and the premise was that they were going to be uh, given some money to help with investigations and so forth of the case. So it's, it's, it's a murky process, it was. And, and the other part of it was that just uh, yet another fluke, the judge at one point uh, was having a conference with some of the security for the um, courtroom prior to the trial and said, you know, we got a real big problem with the, um, the audio in this courtroom and we're going to have a lot of people crammed in. And that's when the HBO guy said, oh, we can help you with that. <laughs> and, and so that, that little piece of, of miracle too. Point is, we shouldn't have, to, we have got how many other people who are innocent in prison this record should be available for, for everybody. It should just be available. 
and it's not that hard. Jason, can you talk about the first time that, that you saw the film? Yeah, the, the first time I saw the film, um, I was at the Barner unit. Um, it, it was right after it came out on VHS in 96. Um, I was woken up by a friend of mine that I'd made friends with at the prison at like 2.30 in the morning. You know, I, have, I had to be at work at like 7, you know, in the kitchen at that time, you know. So I'm like, you know, what are you waking me up for, you know? And this guy doesn't even live in the same barracks where I'm at, you know. And, but he had a job that, you know, gave him liberties in the prison and everything. And he was like, do you trust me? I'm like, yeah, you know. And he's like, well, get up and get dressed. Come on, you know. And honestly, the first thing that crossed my mind, I'm like, oh, please do not let this be some type of escape thing going on, you know, because I do not want to deal with that. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to get shot or anything. But he's like, you know, you trust me? And I'm like, yeah. So I got up, got dressed, and we went to the visitation area in the prison. And there was a, one of those rolling carts with a TV on it and a VHS recorder. And he was like, you drink Mountain Dew? I'm like, yeah. He goes, want a burrito? I'm like, yeah. And, you know, we get all that taken care of. And he already had the, the tape in the VCR, so I didn't see what it was, you know. So that was kind of a mystery. And I'm, I'm the type of guy where, you know, I don't ask a lot of questions a lot of the time. So I'm just like, oh, I'm going to see how this folds out. You know, it's 2.30 in the morning, a movie. That's pretty cool, but I still have work coming up, you know. This has got to be a really good movie. And, <laughs> Surprise to me, um, it started up and there it was, Paradise Lost. And honestly, for me, it is very difficult to watch, you know, to see my family, to see the victims' families and everybody going through such a uh, horrible, painful time and everything. And then to see myself, you know, not even realizing what's going to happen to me, you know, just thinking that everything's going to come out okay, that, you know, everything will, you know, come out in the trial and, you know, we'll be released and go home and everything. And, and life will go back to normal. But I remember um, the guy, my friend there, a after we watched it, he jumped up and punched me in the shoulder. He's like, JB, you're going home. And I'm like, yeah, you know. And many, many years later, <laughs> here I am, you know. But I, I just thank God every day for those films, for, for Joe and Bruce, you know, filming the trial so everybody could see what happened. And, and as painful as it is to watch, I, I, I recognize the necessary, how necessary it was. Interestingly, Joe and Bruce came down, we discussed this a little bit last night, they came down initially thinking they were going to make a movie about rotten teenagers who, you know, done this ritual satanic killing, and as they got involved in the film, they realized that wasn't the case. Can you talk about the evolution, not just from that to we have a different story, but from that to advocacy filmmaking, and both of you can speak on this. Well, I, I, at the time, I didn't really get to know Joe and Bruce that well during the filming of the trial because, like you said, at first they believed we were guilty. They believed that, you know, what they were down there filming was, as Joe says, a real-life River's Edge in relation to that movie. And um, so he kind of kept the distance, a professional distance from me. But he, he'll tell you now that during that time, after he gained access to Damien and Jesse and myself, that he came to believe in our innocence as he was seeing the trials unfold and the investigations unfold. And he was thinking, you know, surely, you know, at the end of this trial, these guys will go home. And at the end of it, at the end of both trials, when we didn't, he and um, Joe and Bruce made a promise to one another, well, to us, even though we weren't present to hear the promise, that they would not give up until we were freed. And they did just that and held true to their word. And I mean, they are two heroes. Mara's a true hero. There are so many heroes. And so one of the points that, that Mara makes in her, in her article on making the case for, for cameras in court is, you know, that just we don't have enough of a sense of how the justice system works. Uh, it's, it's not as if most of us can take off from work and go hang out in a courtroom, even though it's, it's a public space, we're allowed to, but logistically it doesn't really work out for, for, for many of us. Um, I wonder if you can talk about your, as a 16 year old, what your kind of notion of the judicial system was and how that changed as you experienced it. Yeah, I remember um, the night of my arrest, it, 
anybody in America, if you should find yourself arrested for something <laughs> by um, watching movies and TV shows like Law and Order or whatever, you can pretty much expect three things to happen. A mugshot, fingerprinting, and a call home, you know, or anywhere, a phone call. Well, I didn't get the phone call for several weeks. <laughs> My mom didn't know where I was at for a long time. Um, the mugshot happened, true as, you know, it normally happens in any, any case. And then the fingerprinting, they didn't just take my fingerprints, they took my whole handprints and my footprints, um, hair, blood, and saliva. And I had two thoughts on that, I, uh, two, reasons, two reasons. I was thinking, they always do this and they just don't let people know because they don't want criminals and things like that to know this is what they're going to be doing so that you know the criminals can't you know protect themselves from that or whatever or two they actually had something to compare this evidence to they had footprints or you know blood saliva something so for me i thought i, I latched onto that as like the saving grace because you know the night of my arrest, the detectives and things are talking to me, asking me questions, and I'm being honest and straightforward and telling them where I was at, what I was doing, but it just was not what they wanted to hear. And so after they took all this evidence and stuff from me, I was thinking, okay, when they test this, then they'll realize I was telling them the truth. They don't believe me now because everybody arrested says they're innocent. You know, that, that whole phrase that everybody, you know, passes around, which is not true. So that was my hope. And... Then several months later, they came and took the evidence again, you know, the hair, blood, saliva, fingerprints, handprints, footprints, because they didn't have a warrant for it. And I'm thinking, yeah, take it every day if you need to, you know, whatever, whatever you need to do to prove my innocence, do this. And so that was my, my hope. This is what I was holding on to, you know. And then here comes the trial, and they're not talking about any of this evidence. It's the whole thing was about the lack of evidence. There was no evidence. And it just didn't make sense to me. And, you know, years later, finally, the stuff was tested. And then later, when after you watched the movie and your friend said, hey, you're going home, did you think that you were going to go home? And, and as the appeals process, I guess, when did you become jaded? I never became jaded. Um, still not jaded, um, even not exonerated. Um, I, I just thank God every day, um, the appeals process. At that, after I saw the first film, I didn't have attorneys currently working on the case. Nobody was, you know, working on the case. Um, a, after the films came out, I'd already met with um, Kathy Bakken, Burke Sauls, um, uh, Grove Pashley, who, who would go on to form WM3Org and, you know, just kind of centralize everything about the case so anybody who was interested after seeing the films could you know log on to and say hey if there's something I can do you know and kinda um, make it organized you know so that was a good hope and from my family my friends you know everybody who knew me there was always support and love and there was you know just my faith in God and everything there was always that and just my spirit was just always sore and even though my body and he was going through such traumatic and hard times, but I was never really thinking about myself. I was thinking about my mom and my brothers. How can I, you know, do my very best to not make them worry any more than what they are, you know? So there was no room for being jaded. And did the, did the films, you know, as they continued to come out and the publicity increased, did that change the way you were treated in prison, both good and bad? Well, definitely, and even before the films came out, um, as I, you know, when I first got to prison, it was like they were all just waiting on me because they had seen the trial coverage and footage, and you know things like that, and it, it was, you know, I've got, I've got broken bones and stuff, but I don't want to really get into all that. It, it was rough for you know a while, but as you know, the guys in there got to know me, and as I was always telling them I'm innocent, you know, they're like, whatever. But they finally started believing me, and then the films reinforced that. And pretty soon, by the time I left, you know, the day I got there, it was all curses and wish you were dead and, you know, beatings and spittings and all that stuff. But when I left, it was hugs and tears and tears of joy and people saying, you know, my prayers are answered, you know. And, and they were even, like, consoling me, you know, like, you did the right thing. Just go be free. Go live your life, you know, in reference to the Alfred plea. So... 
Yeah, well, can, can you talk a little bit about the offer plea? I think that's something that a lot of people are interested in. You know, it, initially it was framed as you were the reluctant one, you, you really wanted to stay and fight it out, out, but you wanted to save Damien. I didn't want to stay, that, that's the truth. Um, none of us deserve to be there a single moment, a single minute, you know. But at the same time, I was willing to do that, to you know, pursue the right path and be completely exonerated. Um, the state could have gave us you know, a, a different choice. You know, they could have looked at the evidence and said, you know what, there's no evidence to support your conviction. We believe your innocence, dropping charges, setting you free, and we're gonna open the case back up to find who really committed these crimes. But that wasn't on the table. And like I was talking about, you know, my life in prison you know, I made a life there. I made friends. People cared about me. People looked out for me. People prayed for me. It was not where I deserved to be. It was not where I belonged. And every day I prayed for release. But even all that, I was still willing, willing to stay, no matter how long it took, even if it was another 18 years, you know, to do the right thing. But I could not make that decision for Jesse. I could not make that decision for Damien. I could not make that decision for their families. You know, their situations were different, you know, and I totally understand them wanting to be free right then, no matter the cost. And the choice was, you know, all or nothing. And they were ready to go. I mean, I was ready to go too, you know. So for them to save Damien's life, I took this Alfred plea. I mentioned in the intro that you were, you're going to school. You're also doing a lot of adv advocacy work. Can you talk more about that? and especially as it relates to your efforts to exonerate yourself. Definitely, um, you know, you hear a lot, there's a, there's a phrase that goes around, people say, um, things happen for a reason. I believe that, but I also believe you can choose the reason. Um, I've been through a lot in life, and I definitely don't wanna see anyone else go through what I went through, what Damien went through, what Jesse went through, and I, I practically just dedicate my life to justice and to, you know, preventing innocent people from going to prison and to rescuing those innocent people who are currently in prison. And while I was there, while I was in prison, you know, I grew up there and I met a lot of people who were actually guilty of their crimes, but I believe deserve a second chance. So that's another thing I believe in. And I also believe that the death penalty is wrong. If for no other reason, then you can really end up killing a person who is innocent, as what almost happened to Damien. And really almost happened to me because they were trying to give me the death penalty. And so now that I'm free, I'm blessed with a scholarship, going to college. Um, hopefully, as you mentioned, I can go to law school if I'm, you know, my grades are good enough and whatnot. Um, and, and, you know, work on these things. Um, you, you mentioned the um, foundation that um, John and I founded today, Demand Justice, I mean, Proclaim Justice, and, you know, this is what my life is about, and I'm, I'm willing to spend, you know, my entire life doing this. Mara, I didn't, but you, you're at work at a sequel to Devil's Knot. The, the, the media coverage and the publicity surrounding the case is not anywhere near to being over. What sort of effect do you think that will have on, you know, their prospects for exoneration, the reputation of the state? I think we're in for a, an even bigger black eye. We've, we've uh, taken it on the chin because of the actions of state officials, which we really can't say are just the state officials. We, we are the people, and when someone is sentenced to prison, we the people do it. And this is why I think we need so much more transparency in our courts so that we the people can know what we the people are doing to other people in our courts. But as a result of this particular case and the way it's turned out, there have been the three HBO documentaries that are all out now and have been viewed countless times and will be continued to show around the world. On Christmas Day, the Jackson's film, West of Memphis, is going to be released internationally, uh, which is also a documentary about this case. And then next year, as you mentioned, the feature film of my book, Devil's Knot, will be coming out. 
I think it's going to be wham, wham, wham to the state of Arkansas, and we don't need it. And my sense is that there are two things we can do. The first thing that ought to be done very fast is we ought to exonerate these guys. We ought to be demanding of our governor that this happen, that these men be exonerated, and that the state put its resources into a sincere investigation of who actually did kill those children. Uh, thank you. I, and, and then I think in a more forward-looking way, this is an opportunity for us to take the lead nationally and say, let's, let's do something, let's learn something from this, and let's show the nation that we have learned something from this, and let's take the real progressive step of saying, not just we're gonna wallow around in the debate about who's gonna get a camera into the courtroom and under what conditions and so forth and so on, but say, no, we want our courts to do the recording. Put the cameras in, just as the Arkansas Supreme Court has for its own courts. Here, it, do it for every court and get it done, get it available, and, and show the nation that we don't need to spend the next 10 years dealing with questions that really should have been settled 25 years ago. We can, we can be, take a lead on this. So, so if, uh, I, th I think we have both an obligation on one hand with regard to exoneration, and we have a great opportunity. And the alternative is, we just get, we just keep on staying way behind the curve and getting beat up by this. So my suggestion is, we all tell every public official we know that this is what we expect, and, and also that when we have prosecutors and judges running for election, we ask them, how do you feel about cameras in the courtroom? What's your position on that? It's not a partisan thing, just how do you feel about it? It's a very legitimate question. I think now is time to take questions from the audience. Yeah, please wait for the microphone. Sir. Saw Supreme Court watch footage of the trials? Not to my knowledge. Sir. Ms. Leverett, I met you back in 2006, and uh, good to see you again. Jason, it's an honor to be here and get to see you. Um, I've got a question for both of you. Mar, I'm all about transparency. I should work for the federal uh, courts here. Uh, I fully agree with there should be cameras in the courtroom, but I know we're always being told, you know, watch your money, this fiscal cliff, you know, you hear about all this government funding. Where, where can we find those funds at? How do we advocate getting those funds? And then if I can, if I can ask Jason, if you'll answer that one a second. On the Alfred plea, how did, when, when you guys took that, how does that affect you with like Son of Sam laws and that kind of thing? Are you guys able to profit telling your story being in movies, that kind of thing. And I don't know if you can answer that or not, but if you could, I've, I've always been interested on how you guys work that out. My answer on the uh, financial question is that we, how many, how many of you have a camera on you right now? Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't think, uh, technology has, has answered this largely for us. These, these are not highly expensive systems that could be installed. And there are, there are delicacies about the courtroom. For instance, in Massachusetts right now, a lot of issues, for instance, a, a question about if, if, um, if a gang member wants to get up and testify against another gang member and doesn't want to be shot when he leaves the courtroom, how do you protect him? And so they are working out systems where the judge has the on and off switch, can keep the audio going, stop the video, distort the voice, all these kinds of things. We've got great technology and it's not, not expensive. And I say weighing it against the 
cost of keeping Jason Baldwin alone in prison for 18 years unnecessarily, that alone <laughs> could probably equip every courtroom in the state and, and is, is more than worth it. Jason on the Alfred plea. Yes, um, the Son of Sam law is a, a great law and it is put forth for the purpose of um, making sure that people who commit crimes cannot profit off those crimes. Um, Damien and Jesse and myself have committed no crime, so therefore we can't profit off the crime. Uh, with the films, the Devil's Night and everything, we're, we're just sharing what happened in our lives. We're just, you know, sharing with everybody and the viewers what, what's gone on with our lives, what we've been through. Not a crime that we've committed because we have not committed any crime. Ma'am? Um, so um, I know you mentioned about cameras in the courtroom and, and that importance, but it seems like a lot of wrongful convictions stem from police interrogation procedures and hang-ups with those. Is it your goal that if we can get cameras in the courtrooms first, that the next step would be recording all interrogations, or how do we mesh the two goals? So glad you asked. <laughs> um, one of the problems, one of the fundamental problems with this case was that Jesse Miss Kelly was interviewed first by the police and out of several hours, close to eight hours of questioning, only two brief periods totaling about an hour were um, recorded. Those were played at his trial and uh, presented as a confession, distorted as the statements he made were. Partly because of that, a, a group of people, some of whom are here tonight, got together and asked, uh, tried to find out what is the status of, of recording police interrogations in Arkansas. And in the process, we learned that we learned what was being done in all different states about, about this. And there is quite a movement, quite a huge movement, and where it's been done once after the police get over their initial resistance, typically, they love it. They love it because it is very effective in courtrooms to show the conditions under which the uh, statement was made and that the guy wasn't beaten over the head and there, it was respectful, and, but he did blurt out, yes, I did it. Uh, where, where it is used, it is very um, much appreciated by the police but there is still tremendous resistance to it. In our state, we learned that the Arkansas um, Supreme Court had formed a committee a few years ago to look into the possibility of, of ordering police to record. Anything that they expected might end up in court had to be uh, recorded. And the committee that they had appointed had not really accomplished much, and the, the, this discussion was languishing. So. We wrote and uh, got together packets of what other states were doing and presented a lot of information to the court. They prodded their committee to do something. Last July, the Arkansas Supreme Court issued an order saying that if uh, police uh, bring in somebody for questioning, it has to be recorded from beginning, electronically recorded. We had been hoping for video. We wanted them to say video recorded. Instead, they made it electronically recorded, so it can just be audio. But in any event, that's a step forward, and it has to be electronically recorded from beginning to end if it is going to be presented at trial. And if they want to present a statement that police took at trial that wasn't recorded, then the police have got to offer a good explanation for why it was not electronically recorded, and the judge has the discretion of deciding whether that excuse is good enough. So big step forward from the Jesse Miss Kelly interrogation days, not as far as it needs to go. It really does need to be video. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Baldwin, can you and the others vote? And if not, does that um, hinge on exoneration, which Mara, you had touched on? 
if you could um, explain a little more about exoneration. There are a lot of myths out there in the social media as to what the process is and who can actually exonerate. Thankfully, I voted for the first time in my life this past, this past voting session in Washington. The law there is if you are not currently incarcerated, you can vote. So I'm definitely not incarcerated anymore. So uh, um, Holly um, is, is amazing, and she helped me through the whole process. And I got my ballot and everything that was on it and pulled everything up online and researched every little thing on there and cast my vote and rip, you know let my voice be heard. And, and I'll try to uh, say something about the exoneration process, and, and you may know more uh, than I. It, in my understanding, it is the governor's business. He is the one who can do it, not asking for a pardon, because there's nothing to be pardoned. There was no crime to be pardoned. Uh, but to say that we do not believe that these guys are, are guilty, and I think it's entirely in the governor's hands. Is that your understanding, Jason? Yeah, that's true because we took the Alper plea um, and waived all of our rights to our current appeals and everything. However, um, Scott Ellington, you know, has has said that he was open to any evidence that we find, and we've we've been bringing evidence and things to him. Um, there's a lot of things we haven't got tested yet that we've been trying to get tested for years now, and we're working on that and everything. But you're totally right. The governor can, you know. And, and Scott Ellington is the prosecuting attorney in the district where you were convicted. Correct. And he said um, at another one of these events uh, last year that uh, right after the release that if the attorneys for these guys who are continuing to pursue investigations in the case, if they can present to him evidence that he, Mr. Ellington, finds persuasive, he will uh, investigate. So far, uh, despite evidence having been brought to him, he apparently hasn't found it um, persuasive enough to move forward on it. Other right. Questions? I, don't, I don't know what he's looking for and, and what would be persuasive enough. But, I mean, I had a mullet back then. I shed like a cat, and, you know, had I been there, my hairs would have been everywhere. And because of that alone, you know, <laughs> definitely no, I wasn't there. <laughs> the mullet defense. <laughs> the mullet. I'd, I mean, I'd, li I'd like to extend that thought of uh, a video to that of recording expert witnesses. Because when you have an expert witness in that room frequently, no one else in that room has any idea whether what they are saying is really completely accurate or not. And the attorneys generally look for inconsistencies in what they say in, in order to perhaps discredit that expert witness testimony. If uh, those witnesses, if those expert witnesses knew that their colleagues yeah. could see what they're saying, I think there may be an added emphasis on, on being accurate. I love that point. <laughs> back, back in the back. Hi, Mr. Baldwin. Um, I had a question about your relationship with Mr. Eccles and Mr. Miss Kelly. Um, now that your names have become associated with this really incredible story i mean i mean you've you've reached an almost a quasi celebrity status and i'm curious how that has affected uh, your personal relationship with mr eccles particularly as well as mr miss kelly i don't i'm not sure if it's the celebrity status or whatever that's going you know that is anyway um damien he he he's trying to you know get past being in prison, he's trying to get past, you know, being one of the West Memphis Three and everything. He's trying to put all of that behind him and move on with his life. And, and Jesse, I mean, honestly, I'm worried for the guy. Um, he, he's still living here in Arkansas, living in West Memphis, and he's having difficult times financially um, with work, um, with family. His father is in poor health and everything, and 
and I, I just worry for him all the time. As far as the relationship goes, um, we don't communicate much, honestly. Um, I had a number for Jesse for a while, and I'd text him, send him photos. You know, I'm like, hey, this is what I'm doing now. You know, how are you, and things like that. And then, you know, his number was disconnected, you know, for various reasons and stuff. And I hear he's got another phone number. Somebody, if they've got it, I'd love to have it. Um, and, and, and Damien, you know, I, I send him texts and, and same, you know, and emails and stuff. Um, you know, I, I went, went, been to New York a couple of times, and when he was staying there, I stopped by and visited him, you know, with, with Holly and his wife, Lori, and stuff. And, but he, he's just trying to move on past all this, I think. But there was a time when he was very upset about uh, my involvement with, with Mara and, and the screenplay of um, Devil's Knot because initially he, he said um, it, it, was, it was too painful of a script, that the script was not um, accurate and things like that as far as, you know, when it concerned him. And me being me, my first thing was, okay, have you talked to the people who have the script, you know, like, Mara or uh, Elizabeth Fowler, who is part of the production team and everything, who is over it and everything, and he hadn't, you know, he's just like, you know, I don't, I don't like it, but I'm more of a type of person, okay, if you don't like something, well, do something to make it to where you like it or to where it's more accurate and everything, and Elizabeth and Mara and everybody involved with the project is totally open. In fact, want feedback, want feedback from anyone and everyone involved who knows about the story to make it factually accurate, you know? And I found, found Elizabeth and, and definitely Mara to be totally open. There was just a few things and we went through the script, you know, several times to make sure, you know, things were accurate and, you know, portrayed everybody involved accurately. And he's, he still doesn't like it. Um, and in fact, he um, sent me a text, you know, before I even agreed to work on it, when I was just, you know, trying to make sure it was factually accurate and everything, saying he would no longer speak to me or, or um, have a public appearance with me and things like that. And, you know, but, you know, I, 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 later on, I, I just, you know, people would ask me, you know, the same question, you know, what our communication was. And I, and I never hit onto it and said that we weren't talking anything because, you know, I just hoped that he would open back up and realize, you know, that there was nothing wrong with the film being made. It, it, wouldn't, it wasn't painting him in a light that wasn't true or accurate and it wasn't designed to hurt him or anything like that. But finally, you know, someone, you know, people kept asking questions and he, his book came out and he mentioned it in there and everything, so I had to, you know, mention it and my, on my Facebook I had to put out a public statement about it and stuff and then he finally started texting me back again and things like that but I mean I love him I love Jesse and all of our families and things I wish him the best and I just you know I, I see him and he's always talking about how hurt and how painful and things are I just hope he can you know heal and get past it I, I like to think I, I've known these guys for almost since their convictions. And I'd like you all to think back to uh, any two people you knew in high school and how many of them you're still best buds with. And these three were artificially thrown together and they became the West Memphis Three thanks to the state of Arkansas. There was absolutely nothing other than the trial that would dictate trials that would dictate that they wouldn't have gone three entirely separate ways anyway and it makes perfect sense that they have they have like, different guys and different lives that's the way it should be other questions Good evening. Uh, last night, a young man was questioning you about um, why hasn't anything been done to go after the prosecutors, the sheriff, or the police officials who uh, raised such a fuss and mishandled the investigation. Well, that's usually covered under a little something called good faith immunity. I'd like to ask all three of you, uh, putting cameras in the courtroom, how will that affect, how will that change, if at all? good faith immunity and make them more make everybody involved 
more accountable to the public. May I grab that one? <laughs> the way I see it is that we need transparency first. You get the transparency, then you get the accountability. Nobody would know how, what, what happened in this case if it were not for the films. Nobody, they happened, the trials happened, and like 99.99% .99 of the trials that happened day in and day out in Arkansas and everywhere else in the country, they vanish except for some musty transcript if one is ever, ever actually written. And so, so we need, in order to have accountability, we first have to see. We also, once we have, once we can see, once we can find out online in particular, how, how our courtrooms are being run, then we can go to the polls and we can become more informed voters. We can actually know how this prosecutor behaves in court, how that judge behaves in court, and what, what we're going to do when we cast our vote. Right now, what, what do we know about the candidates for judicial office? We are, we are ignorant about these very crucial positions. So transparency, and then at least we can hold them accountable in court, and then ultimately I think there has got to be a uh, system as already exists in Texas of all places and in other states where if someone like Jason, Damien, Jesse is taken away from their lives for 18 years and suffers in prison for that long, that there is a a policy that dictates that they can be paid at least in money for what happened, what was taken from them. Right now, there is nothing, there is nothing that th for them to, to be paid back for what was taken by the state from their lives. And I think that once there's a price tag on getting somebody like him in prison for a long time and losing that much of his life, I think all of a sudden we're going to see a lot more accountability in the courtrooms. You pretty much covered it all, Mara. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. Back. Sorry. John Christopher Peeler sends you his regards. He still considers himself a friend of yours. And when he went to court, William C. MacArthur was drunk on bourbon whiskey. The three witnesses against him all tested positive for illegal drugs, and that doesn't show up on the transcript. And I was charged with the same murder that he was charged with. And when I went to court, I used my get out of jail free card and my friendship with a violent, my affiliation with the Violent Crime Task Force and my friendship with Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton sent two Secret Service agents to my court trial, which you were not invited to, and they had the charges against me dismissed. And thank you for your concern, Mara, and Baldwin, God bless you. <laughs>